Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, and we're here at Mount Vernon, George Washington's famous home, and we're here with another famous general, Colin Powell, who served as a four-star general, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Secretary of State. Colin, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you very much, David. I've been here before, and I've been with you many times before, so I'm looking right. forward We've to our Right, we've had time. events here. Yep. So uh, as we sit here today in this incredible house, um, it was bought many years ago, over 100 years ago, by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, this association has bought it and now they operate it, but they have no men on their board. Do you imagine how anything can work in this world without men on a board? Do you imagine how this could possibly happen? They have demonstrated that to us for the last couple of hundred years almost now, and they've done a great job. They've raised money, they've kept the place looking absolutely beautiful. Um, and I think you would not be successful if you tried to get on the board. I think that's probably true. And uh, I also wonder whether, think about this, we've had uh, 200 plus years of men as presidents of the United States. Have you ever thought what would happen if a woman became president of the United States? Do you think a woman could be a leader as good as the men we've had? David, that is such a sucker question. <laughs> the answer I give you is there's no reason they can't be. I mean, we see them moving up day after day, the Supreme Court, within the Senate, within the House, in cabinet positions, they're slowly moving up, and now we have a Vice President of the United States to be, um, who is in line to be the President if something happens or if she runs for it. So the answer to the question is, women are coming along in a way that I never would have anticipated. We got four-star female generals all over the place. And you better treat them like four stars, not that they're female four stars. So I think we've come a long way in the last couple hundred years, but especially in the last 50 years, when we really, really started pressing on this. I remember once when I was a battalion commander at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 101st Airborne Division, and we'd run every morning. And we sometimes had some paratroop songs that we sang from the old days. And one morning my battalion commander, my brigade commander, spotted me running with my troops and using some language that perhaps was not appropriate for that because there was a women's formation right behind me. We still had women's formations. And so later that day he called me aside and said, don't ever use language like that anymore in the, in the division. And I never did. Um, and uh, it took me a while to clean it all up, but I'm in pretty good shape. So we're going to talk about leadership today and uh, something you know a great deal about. But let's talk about when you started out uh, your career. Uh, you went to CCNY, uh, City College of New York, uh, where there's now a college named after you. Yes. And it's operating and has, what, 6,000 students in it? About 6,000, yes. Okay. And I assume you've done many things of which you're proud, but I assume you're very proud that a city college is named a college after you. Well, it's not quite an entire college. It's sort of a part of a college, but it's about a third of a college. Um, and it was done because I, when I got there, after I left the State Department and retired from government, I went up there and somebody had endowed some money to the small little think tank that we had. Um, and uh, so it was very interesting for a while. You were helpful at that point, David, as well. Um, and I, after a while, I said, I don't need another think tank. I want a place where young students can come and we can give them an education, but the education they're getting, they have to take out into the community and use. So we're teaching them. That's why they call you know, global leadership, service and leadership. And the academic part is part of that. And so these kids really went crazy over it. I mean, they really love it. And it went from just a small think tank of maybe 30 or 40 kids, now to about 6,000. Now, the children that go there, the young people that go there, are they the children of private equity people or hedge fund people or people who've been around colleges for a long time or not? No, they were like me. They were immigrant kids. Um, not all. Many of them are, you know, were born there and they have parents who are very solid parents. But it really is an immigrant college. And all the youngsters I knew when I went there 60 or 70 years ago, uh, they came from an immigrant background. There were a lot of Jewish kids who were there. That's how I learned how to speak a little Jewish. It helped me a great deal in my adult life. Uh, and because it, you just saw these immigrant kids who are working at it. I look at my immigrant parents. I mean, my mother didn't finish, she finished high school, my father did not. I had cousins all over the place. My sister was sent off to school in Buffalo and became a teacher. Um, and nobody knew exactly what I was going to do. It was causing a great deal of distress within the family. Uh, and then I finally finished 
with a C average, beautiful C average, the undergraduate stuff, the, you know, the high school and all that. And I wanted to go somewhere. And my mother said, you must apply to the Bronx High School of Science and to Stuyvesant, the two top high schools in New York City. And, okay, mom, that's what you want me to do. So I applied and they wouldn't accept me. And the, the, the counselor said, no, you're not ready for anything like this. So I went to Morris High School where they had to let you in. There was no you know, constraints on letting you in. Um, and that's all I was able to do. Really, It was a good, it was a good sh time being shut down because I was not really for what they were offering. So I went to City College of New York. I got in there somehow with another C average. And then something happened at the end of the second semester. I saw ROTC cadets marching around the school. And I realized, hey, that's pretty cool. So I joined ROTC. The ROTC faculty made it clear to me that you got to do it our way. We don't believe in C's. You got to get A's in everything we give you. And then we'll see where you go. Well, uh, I went pretty high within ROTC. I became the commandant of the school for all the uh, students who were there in ROTC. Uh, and then I went into the Army uh, in 1958. Um, still a segregated country for the most part. Uh, and they were a little nervous about me going there. The professor of military science at CCNY wanted to make sure that I knew that now that I was going to the South, you know, Fort Bragg, places like that, that I understood the social changes I would face. And I understood it and I got along fine and I did well as a young lieutenant. I never thought I would get far beyond that. Maybe I get promoted to major at some point, uh, but that was all I asked for. And you never thought you'd be the four-star general or chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I assume. I have a joke with this one. I, say, I tell people, people come up to me and say, you know, now that I am a four-star, I was a four-star, they'd come up and say, well, uh, did you go to West Point? No. Did, did you go to one of the schools down south, you know, the, the Citadel or one of those? No. Um, where did you go? CCNY. Uh, what's that? City College in New York. That's it. And you became a four-star general. Did you ever dream you'd become a four-star general? And that's when I have the punchline. I said, yeah, there I was. I was growing up in the South Bronx and then in Harlem, both. And when I was in the South Bronx, a second educational experience, um, there I was, I was on the corner of 163rd and Kelly Street one day and said to myself, self, you know what? I was about 12 years old, you're gonna grow up and become chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Everybody breaks out into laughter. I laughed the loudest. It was unthinkable. I mean, we're talking about a point in time in this country where segregation still existed. It had just ended for the military, but it still existed for the whole country. Um, and I just did the very best I could. And what my NCO sergeants told me when I got there uh, and was you know, trying to adjust to it all, they made it clear. They said, you know, Lieutenant Powell, we don't care what color you are. We don't care where your parents came from. We don't care what school you graduated from. The only thing we care about is your performance. And from your performance, we want to see what your potential is. You understand? Uh, yes, Sergeant, I understand. Good. Now, get out there and do it. And that's what I did for the next 30 years. But for some time you were stationed in the South where on the bases uh, you were treated like you were a white person. Yep. But when you left the bases to get something to eat or do something else, uh, you weren't treated very well. Is that right? Yeah, it, it happened after I had gotten married and gone off to uh, Vietnam early on when it was just starting up. And I came back from that tour. I'd been away for a whole year. I hadn't seen the wife I had known for a few months. Now she's my wife for a year, I haven't seen. And there's a baby, this little boy named Michael, who I'd never met, and there they were. And so one night, I was looking for a house for us, and as I came through Columbus, Georgia, which is the other side of Fort Benning, Georgia, but it was a pretty a city, not part of the post, um, I went up to a store to order a hamburger because I was hungry. And I went right to the front where there's a counter. I knew I couldn't go inside. And the young woman who was behind the counter asked what I was doing. And I said, can I have a, can I have a, a hot dog or a hamburger or something? And she said, no, I don't think so. I said, I just got back from Vietnam, can I? She said, I'm so sorry. I'm from New Jersey. I don't understand any of this. 
but I cannot serve you. I'll take you around the back and get you something. I said, no, thanks. And then I left, went back half a mile to the post, got a hamburger, got it any time I wanted. Uh, and then about six months later, just about July 4th of 1964, the Accommodations Act was signed. And I went down to that place and said, hot dog, please? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You got it. No problem. Had Alma with me at the time. And that was the beginning of the end of segregation. It was the beginning of the end of accommodations restrictions. And what I've often said to people, we just didn't release black people from a problem. We released white people from a problem. This was a problem for both of us. And so I took that attitude into my career. One thing led to another. I went to Vietnam again a second time. Went to Korea, that was the third time away from my family in a period of less than 12 years. Um, and I just kept moving up. But did you ever think of, to yourself, you had uh, uh, prepared to give the last full measure of devotion to this country. Oh yeah. And you were injured in Vietnam. Did you ever say to this person when you came back, you know, I was prepared to give my life for this country and now you won't serve me a hot dog or a hamburger? How did you resist the temptation to I say that? You didn't want to get in trouble. And I didn't want to fight with this lady. She, did, she didn't know why she was there. She was just following it. And I knew I was coming back right after the Accommodations Act was signed. It was in process then. Um, and uh, uh, that's the way it panned out. And except she tried to help me. She said, um, are you one of the African-American students here at, at, at uh, Fort Benning? No. Are you a Puerto Rican? No. Are you a, yes, I'm black. That's it, that's it. I can't serve you. So I'll be back. So you rose up eventually to become a four-star general. Did either of your parents live to see that event? Um, four-star, no. My only parent who saw me get promoted to general was my mother, and she saw me promoted to one-star. Uh, what did she say? She said, I knew that was always going to happen? No, oh no, no. But what was amusing about it all is that the whole family wanted me to get out of the army. All my relatives. And so the way they said, that there's only one thing to do, have Aunt Larice talk to him. Aunt Larice was kind of, you know, the senior person in the, in the, in the family. And so she invited Alma and me, my wife, uh, to uh, lunch one day. And she was just lecturing us something awful. You know, you've been hurt twice. Every time you went over there to, to, to Vietnam, you got hurt. You're in a helicopter crash. You fell in a, a pit hole. Uh, we are worried that if you go back again, you'll die. They'll kill you. And uh, you've got to leave now. And I said, Larice, you don't understand. I'm a professional soldier. I can't leave. This is what I do. This is where I go. This is my profession. And she still wasn't persuaded. So I said, oh, did I tell you that? Larice, when I have gotten 20 years in, and I'm about 41 years of age, uh, 20 years in, I can retire. And they'll pay me my full retirement pay for the rest of my life. And in typical immigrant fashion, she said, stay, you know, it's a good deal, stay. And I did. Well, you rose up and uh, one day you get a call from a friend of yours, uh, Frank Carlucci, who uh -huh. said, I'd like you to come back. I've just named the National Security Advisor to President Reagan, and I want you to come back to be the Deputy National Security Advisor. And you were in Germany, I think, at the time. And you said, well, I, I like my job now. I'm commanding uh, soldiers. But uh, ultimately, he said, well, I really want you. And you said, the President of the United States wants me. He should call me. And what happened? It was one of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life. How, how could I have ever believed that I had said the President has to call me? And I was just desperate. I was in a beautiful core headquarters, a monstrous room, twice as large as this room. And I was going to be a, in a little room this big in one of the smallest sections of the White House. And I really wanted to stay with troops. I'd been pulled out of troops before for these jobs in the Pentagon or in the, in the White House. And so when Frank Carlucci, who had taken me out of assignments before, told me that, you know, Iran Contra, you got, you, we gotta have you back. I've just become the National Security Advisor. I need you here. I said, Frank, come on, you're doing it to me again. I need you here, and the President wants you here. And then I did one of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life, as if I didn't know what the answer was. So I said, well, if, if I'm that important, why doesn't the President call? 
And as I walked away from the phone, I said, oh, you dumb SOB. And about 15 minutes later, the phone rings. Hello? Oh, General Powell, how are you? This is Ronald Reagan. Yes, sir. And I stood there, so the tension in my kitchen, in my underwear, in my jammies. And uh, I said, yes, Mr. President. He said, you know, we really need you back here. Yes, sir, we're on the way. <laughs> it's all you can do as a soldier. And it turned out to be a turning point in my whole life, my whole career. So you later became, when Frank became Secretary of Defense, you became the National Security Advisor uh, for Ronald Reagan at the end of his term. And then later, uh, you went back to the military in terms of commanding troops. But then um, you get appointed by George Herbert Walker Bush to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Did you mm -hmm. ever think that was going to happen? No. Why should I? I'm just an immigrant kid. Well, some immigrants out of the South Bronx in Harlem. I wasn't expecting that. But um, I fell into a great relationship with not only Frank, but with President, Vice then Vice President Bush, but especially with President Reagan. And the way it happened, we were having a meeting in the Situation Room. And uh, I was chairing the meeting because Frank wasn't there. I didn't know where Frank was, the National Security Advisor. And the President wasn't there. And so Schultz is there and all the other major cabinet members are there. And so I'm presiding over it, which I did regularly. And then suddenly Frank walks in and sits down on that side of the table. And right behind him is President Reagan. He's sitting at the end of the table. So I'm wondering quite what happened. And so Frank scribbles a note out to me. Uh, and he passes it down the table to me. And I open up this little piece of paper note. And it says, you are now the National Security Advisor. Nobody asked me, Frank. <laughs> I wasn't interviewed. So what? We know you. That was the end of it. And this army, no more army for then. Um, and um, I did that for a total of two years, deputy and national security advisor. President Reagan and I formed a great relationship, as I did with uh, Vice President Bush. Uh, and so it came to the end, and Frank's gone off, and so I'm free. I can get back to the army. Not so fast. And uh, so I stayed for a while longer. Uh, and finally, I was able to break free of the White House. Um, and go back to the Army. I told all of them, I'm not retiring from the Army out of the White House. I gotta retire from the Army to get out of the Army. And so that's what I wanna do, I wanna go back to the Army. Bush, when he became president, elected president, he did something that was rather unusual. It was about two days after his election. Uh, we had offices right next to each other, separated only by a bathroom. Um, and uh, so he called me in. I said, what's he calling me? And so he said, I want to offer you a couple of jobs. And he offered me three jobs in the highest positions in the government. And I said, thank you. Uh, let me go home and talk to my wife about it, Alma. And I went home, barely spoke to her about it because I didn't want any of the jobs. I wanted to go back to the Army. And uh, so I went and spoke to the chief of staff of the Army and said, do you have anything for me if I come back? You know, I've really been screwing around a lot of different places. He said, no, we got a place for you. So the next morning I went into the Oval Office and the President was there and I said, Mr. President and Mr. Vice President, uh, the Army does want me back. Uh, thank you very much, but I gotta go back to the Army. And Reagan kind of looked over and said, uh, does that include four stars? And I said, yes, Mr. President, I'm, I'm gonna get a fourth star. He said, oh, that's good. And that was it. I got my fourth star, took command of a million soldiers uh, with a headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. And that lasted maybe four months. Uh, and I got a call that, that said, we want you to come see the new Secretary of Defense that was uh, Cheney. Uh, and he said, the president wants you to become the chairman. Uh, president Bush now. I said, I'm the junior four star. You know, there are 15 four stars, and I'm number 15. And uh, I've only been a four star for about three months. Yeah, what's your point? Uh, I said, well, you know, okay. And then so he reported that to the president. And he came back and said, the president has two questions. One, can you do it? No infantry officer will ever say, no, I can't do it. I said, yes, I, I can do it. 
And then he said, Do you, are you worried about having everybody junior to you? Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, they were all junior to me. I'd only been a four-star for a few months. And I said, it's not a problem, uh, Mr. President, and Mr. Carlucci, or Mr. now Cheney. I said, it's not a problem, we're professionals. And it never was a problem, it got along great. So the general public maybe didn't know you as well as people in Washington did, but they got to know you because uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and you were given the task of figuring out how, with Norman Schwarzkopf, the general of CENTCOM then, to figure out how to get him out of Kuwait. Were you ever worried that that wasn't going to work out as successfully as we ultimately found it out to be? When we finally got the plan put together, Norm and I were satisfied with it, and we briefed the leadership. Um, we, over, we went more than we ever would need. Uh, and um, so I was not the least bit worried about it. I didn't know how many casualties we'd take. Um, but uh, I went and said to President Bush, I said, Mr. President, I will tell you something. Uh, there's no question about how this war is going to turn out. Don't worry about it. I don't know how many casualties we'll have, but we'll beat them. And they don't know what they're doing out there. The Iraqis have just dug themselves into a little circle or a little U-shaped formation, and they weren't moving. So they were just asking us to knock them out, and we did. We did it, and uh, we got a lot more troops in the region than we might have needed, 5, 500,000 Americans and about 200,000 allies. Um, it was a given. I mean, it was over. As, and we didn't want to fight a war. The president said, send the Secretary uh, Jim Baker over to talk to the Iraqis to say you don't want to do this. We didn't want a war. We just want you to give those well, that land back to Kuwait and, and give it back to Kuwait. By then, though, we, were, we couldn't avoid a war. We didn't want to avoid a war because we were ready for it. At the time, there were predictions when the Senate was voting on whether we should go to war and get approval to do this from the Senate that we would have 10,000 American casualties. Um, how many did we ultimately get? It was about 400, and 200 of those were accidents, friendly in injuries. Norm and I were thinking it might be in the neighborhood of 5,000. Uh, some of the big shots in Washington were saying it was going to be 15, 20,000. We were catching a lot of heck from different parts of the Congress and a number of experts. But I knew it wouldn't be that large, but I couldn't be sure. So Norm and I talked about it very often. Uh, and we thought maybe at, at worst it would be around 5,000. It turned out to be 300 or so military casualties by the enemy and another 300 killed by their accidents or our accidents. Now there's something called the PAL doctrine, which I don't think you called it that, but other people did, which said if you're going to go to war, have massive support and massive number of uh, uh, troops. Is that fair to call it the PAL doctrine? Is that what you said, it have a massive amount of troops? The only, it's perfect except for one thing. It was the invention of a reporter. Right. Reporter came to see me when I was uh, chairman. We had just won the Gulf War, Desert Storm. And he sat down in my office and was asking how we did it and this, that, and the other. And he says, well, you know, give me a simple expression of, you know, the, 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 of, the earth, of your, your theory, you know, the Powell theory, the Powell way of doing it. And I said, well, you know, it's not written in any manual. He said, yeah, but I'm going to write about it. You are? You're going to invent it? He says, yeah, it's going to call the Powell Doctrine. And I said, well, here's, the, in a nutshell, here's what it is. Make sure you've looked at the politics of it. You've looked at the diplomacy of it. You know what you're getting into. And then if you can't find a diplomatic way to get out of it, and you have to go to war, then you go to war with an overwhelming force. I don't use the term overwhelming. I just say decisive force, meaning you will prevail you will win. And we did it in Panama. We did it in several other places. And then Desert Storm came along, and that's exactly what we did. Well, eventually you retired from the military, and you published a book on your life story, which mm -hmm. was a bestseller, needless to say. But it was so popular that people said, well, the author of this book, maybe he should run for president himself. And you did look at it. Why did you not run for president in 1996? Because, uh, I was not a politician, and I wasn't meant to be a politician. 
I thought about it for about two weeks because I was getting such pressure. Uh, and I realized, you know what, this isn't you. You're a soldier. You can't be a politician. You're a good politician, but as long as you're not one. You know, I was not bad in sorting out political issues. But when I faced a military problem, I always had to look both sides and not just, it's gonna be this way. I always had to study both. And I had spent over 35 years at that point just being a soldier. Uh, and so I gave it serious thought. And then one morning I woke up, put my feet on the floor of the bedroom. I shook my head and said, this is not you. This is not you. And so I went downstairs to see my wife, Alma, who was in the kitchen. And I said, Alma, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm, so I'm giving a press conference tomorrow, which says I'm not going to run for political life. And she just looked at me and said, what took you so long? She knew that I would not do it. And what she also knew, I think, is that if I wanted to do it and she didn't want to do it, I wouldn't have done it. So when you're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, your four-star general, and you say to your wife you want to do something and she disagrees, uh, who wins? That Depends on what the issue is. If it's what movie we're going to see, I might prevail. But if it was, uh, you know, going to war or something like that, or running for political office, that was not in the game for her. So you eventually went back into government service, and another doctrine was named after you, uh, the Pottery Barn Doctrine. And this came about when you came back as Secretary of State. And when you became Secretary of State under George W. Bush, eventually he wanted to invade uh, Iraq. And you apparently told him, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, uh, by the way, if you go in there and you break it, you own it, like the Pottery Barn. Now, the Pottery Barn people, did they like that? or was No, that they didn't. And it was a, another reporter, another journalist, uh, got me into that one. Uh, and uh, I never said that. But one of your colleagues in the press did say it, uh, and it made news. Pottery Barn, what a great line, you know. And so everybody started blaming me. Um, and so I didn't. You know, the theory is right, but the, the line is not something I made up. It was just made up by a reporter. I said, it's a pretty good line, though. You know, I'm, I'm making money on this one. And so uh, I accepted it. It's not in any military magazine, not in any military manual. You will not find it, except among the troops. They still like it. Uh, and people said, well, did you come up with this theory out of nowhere? I said, no. If you look carefully at it, you'll find it goes back to the days of Chinese imperialism. It goes back to Clausewitz. It essentially says, if you're going to go to war, make sure you have tried every alternative to satisfy your political objective without going to war. And if you are faced with an enemy who is determined to fight you, then make sure you have put together a force that will win. So for much of your public career, there was a thing called bipartisanship, where Republicans and Democrats actually would come together and maybe pass bills together, talk together, socialize together. That seems to have gone by the wayside. Do you have any uh, reasonable hopes that with the new administration coming in, bipartisanship can come back, or you think it's a day that's it's come and gone? Well, in the first point, you're absolutely right. I, I had a lot of arguments over political issues. How much money do we give to Nicaragua? All kinds of things. But it was always with people who could argue back. And we would argue as balanced arguments. Uh, right now, we don't have that kind of government. And I'm not quite sure um, what will happen in the remaining time for this government. And I have a hunch the president-elect, Mr. Biden, when he becomes president, will be more inclined toward that way of doing business. Uh, the current president, uh, and during his term, he didn't see it that way. Uh, and so we were busy getting out of agreements, sh shooting out at things, uh, and I don't think it served us well. So although you are a registered Republican, uh, and you have voted for Republicans, and you've announced that you were a Republican when you were thinking of maybe running for president, uh, you supported uh, President Obama when he was running, and you supported Joe, ba Joe uh, Biden when he was running. Um, and I think you supported Hillary Clinton when she was running. I think so, yeah. Right? So um, have you ever thought of maybe becoming a Democrat? You've supported a number of Democratic candidates and... No, I had a better idea. I live in a 
state of Virginia where you are not registered as anything. You just decide what you want to do that term. And so I have also voted for uh, Lyndon Johnson. Um, so I have voted for both Republicans and Democrats. And when I'm asked about it, especially my children ask me about it, I said, examine both sides. See which makes the most sense to you. See which one you think is right for the country. And then that's who you vote for. I don't know any other way to do it properly. And I've always tried to do it properly. The scariest time I ever had was in Alabama one time after I'd gotten back from Vietnam. And um, still segregation was still the, the, the system in that part of the world, Sylacauga, Alabama. And so I was driving a Volkswagen, a German car. Uh, and I came through Sylacauga and a cop was waiting, state trooper, he pulled me over. And he looked at my license and my license plate and he came back to me and he said, I've noticed that you got this little German car. I also noticed that you got an all the way with LBJ sticker on the side of it and you got a New York license plate. Son, you need to get out of here as fast as you can. Yes, sir. <laughs> and it's the way it was. So um, George Washington, who built this house and lived here for many, many years, of course, he passed away at the age of 67. Uh, can you imagine what it was like to be the general in a Revolutionary War with very few troops fighting against the best army in, in the world? Uh, if you had ever had a chance to meet with George Washington, what would you like to have asked him? I would like to have asked him, how did you analyze these situations? I mean, how did you decide to take a chance here? Uh, he was a remarkable soldier, uh, and he lost quite a few battles, uh, and he kept coming back. Uh, and he's been in different parts of the army in different sections of the uh, security system. But he improved with each exercise. And he never lost faith in himself. And he never lost, lost faith in the country he was doing it for. Uh, and so that was remarkable. Would I be the same kind of person? I have always tried to be the same kind of person, although never with the kind of situations he was facing. And what the British didn't know is that he had the country. You know, British were far away from home, uh, and that was a disadvantage. So the president could always, well, at the time, uh, our president at the time, George Washington, if he got trapped, he could always move to somewhere, go off to New Jersey or somewhere else, and just reassess his situation and bring the troops back, and then train them and get help. French helped, the Germans helped. Um, and finally, he overwhelmed them, and the British had to give up Yorktown. So, as an African American, uh, what has been your view of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, and how do you think people should look at George Washington? He was our first president, uh, the leader of the Revolutionary War, but he was a slave owner. Um, so, do you think we should still honor people like George Washington, even though they were slave owners? And do you think that the Black Lives Matter movement will change racial relations in the foreseeable future? I think Black Lives Matter is a, is, is a reasonable statement of the situation we are in now. But I also say to my audiences, uh, Black Lives Matter, but you want to know something? All lives matter. And so we have to think about all Americans. Black Lives Matter is resting on sound ground, but I just can't look at Black Lives Matter. I have to look at White Lives Matter too. It's like I told you earlier, I had to look at all sides of an issue. Um, and um, we'll face this up. I think things are improving. Um, you know, how, did, how the devil did I ever become Secretary of State or four-star general or commander of the largest group of soldiers in the United States Army? It's because I demonstrated professionalism and I demonstrated, you know, potential. And so in my talks to young people, and I do a lot of that, or my school at City, City College in New York, I always tell them, you've got to do your very, very best. And you have got to make sure that you are also showing potential. Because people say, well, how did you become, you know, how did you get promoted to four stars? I said, just did the best I could. 
And guess what? They never promised me anything. They never promised me four stars. The only thing they asked me to do, wanted me to do, and I did, was every night when I went home, I said to myself, did you have a good day today as a soldier? And as I became more senior, I would answer it this way, you know, they're my soldiers, I have to take care of them. I've got to be the best I can be. Did I make mistakes? Yes. Did I screw things up? Yes. Was I criticized by my superiors? Occasionally. Uh, but that's part of growing up. And I teach young people. Uh, one school I went to in Japan once, and a, and a young student raised her hand and said, have you ever failed at anything, General? I said, yeah. Um, do you ever, you know, are you ever afraid? I said, yes. I said, you can't live without being afraid of something at some point, at some time, and you will fail. You have to fail. It's part of living. I failed. The question is, what do you do about it? And the answer I give to so many audiences is that you figure out what you failed about and what to do, how to fix yourself, not to start pointing fingers at people. You may have to do that to a couple of people, but what you really have to do is figure out what did you miss? What did you do wrong? And fix yourself. And then once you have looked at that failure and you've corrected yourself and the rest of the organization, don't ever touch it again. A lot of people come up and say, oh, well, you know what happened to me in 1952? I said, I don't care what happened to you in 1952. What happened to you last year? And have you fixed it? You know, and was I afraid? Sure. My first night in combat, first day in combat in Vietnam, um, we were going down a trail. And I was about the third person in the column. And suddenly, fire broke out. Bullets were flying everywhere. Um, and when we got over it, the guy who was two people in front of me, a Vietnamese soldier, uh, was dead. He was killed. And we had to wrap him in a, in a poncho and carry him around for a couple of days so we can get a helicopter to get him out. But that night, as I went to bed, or went to my you know, blanket, I said to myself, oh my god, they're going to do this again tomorrow. And they did. And you just had to learn to deal with fear. Fear is a natural, it's a, it's a natural thing in you. And so you have to learn about how to deal with failure and how to, do with, to deal with fear. And I worked on that for a long time. And uh, my failures sometimes held me back. I was not always you know, going straight up. Uh, I, had a, I had a habit of telling people what I thought. And I would get in trouble occasionally. One of my bosses said to me, you know, you, you spoke too much the other day. I said, I have to. I'm the military advisor to the president. I cannot ignore what I felt and thought that he ought to know and feel. Chew me out, go ahead. Right. But you've got to hear what I believe in. So if the President of the United States called you, uh, President-elect Biden, as we talk today, uh, and said, I need some advice on how to bring the country together, uh, you're a great leader, what would you tell him he should do to kind of bring the country together and maybe get rid of some of the partisan divide? Is there any one or two answers you would have? Yes. First answer I would have is start reaching out to the whole country and not just to a group of people who are your buddies and your, your gang. You know, get people on your staff who will argue with you. Get people who are working with you who will challenge you. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best. And the next thing I would tell them to do is, we have so many friends and allies in this world that we have put at risk to being friends and allies of us. That's not the way we gained ascendancy of this country. We gained ascendancy as the number one nation of democracy in this country by talking to friends, by trusting people, by giving them what they need if it's reasonable. So many times in my career as a soldier, in my career as a national security advisor or sex state, I'd face some problem from a friend uh, and I would just sit and listen. I'd want to throw them out, I don't want to hear this, but I didn't. These are foreigners, uh, and, and the stories are rather cute, but I don't have time to tell you all of them. But to have the Spanish, quick one, the Spanish 
foreign minister calls me. I'd never met her. She just got the job. And she said to me, you've got to help me. I said, what's wrong? You know, we have an island just off the coast of, um, of, of uh, North Africa. Uh, and uh, the Moroccans took it. Uh, and when we saw that, you know, we had to go and take it back. And you did that, yes. Well, what's the problem? Well, now that they're coming back, and they won't stay away. So would you help us get a deal between us and the other side? Um, and so I said, but it's not my business. Haven't you talked to the EU or NATO? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. They turned us down. You got to do it. Right. And so that's what I did. I worked on it for two days all by myself at home. I typed up the actual agreement between these two countries. Um, and um, my lawyers were not happy with that when they saw it the next week. Uh, but I solved it. And the only crisis I had was that they had two different names for the island. One, the African Asian name, and the other one was a European name. Uh, and so they said, well, we can't agree to this with two names. We'll never get agreement. So I thought about it and called down to my geographers in the State Department. I said, give me the exact place that this island is located. What's its latitude, longitude? Right. Tell me exactly what it is. And that's what I got. And that's what I put in the agreement. There's no name, just latitude, longitude. And they agreed. That's it. You, gotta, you, have to, you have to work hard and find solutions for your friends. So you and your wife have led America's Promise for quite some time, an organization you helped start. And uh, it's designed to help young people become uh, productive citizens and maybe mm -hmm. leaders as well. Yeah. Uh, to young people that talk to you and say, I want to be Colin Powell, I want to be a leader, I want to help my country, what do you think are the most important leadership qualities they should have? What is it that makes somebody a leader and somebody not a leader? My time, you can't be Colin Powell. Worry about being yourself. And here, first, America's promise, we isolated this into five promises that we wanted every child in America to get. One, promise number one, is to make sure that you have an adult in your life. A responsible, loving, caring adult should be in the life of every child. Hopefully a parent, a relative, a mentor, but somebody who would put this child in the right path and not get in trouble. We don't have enough of these. The second promise was you need a place to, to go play. You, you, you need to have boys and girls clubs, things like that. And we have to put those together for these kids. And then the third one was every youngster should have responsible health care. We don't do enough of this. The whole country ought to be on health care. Uh, and I've spoken out, spoken out about this repeatedly. We deserve it for every American. And then the fourth promise was a quality education. Every kid, you cannot survive in this world, in this country, without some kind of quality education. And the fifth promise was make sure that you give back that you are giving some service back to the country. It's a simple, simple little formula, and it, it works if you put people to work on it. Boys and Girls Clubs, Salvation Armies, people like you, people like me, uh, and, and that works fine. So some people say, I've said, the highest calling of mankind is to be a private equity professional. Some people don't agree. Um, some people say the highest calling is to be a four-star general. So. Uh, um, John Allen is a four-star general, head of Brookings, and you're a four-star general. Why do you think four-star generals are more important to the country than private equity people? I've never presented myself as being more important than the country or anybody. Um, here I am. If you think I can do something for you, um, let's talk about it. And if I can, uh, and if you can, if you're working with it as well, the guy who's calling me, um, I'll do it. And in many occasions, when I was in the military, we didn't get that kind of option. Pow, go there. Pow, go there. You're now a four-star general. Uh, you're now a corps commander in Germany with 70,000 troops. Uh, that made life a lot easier. You just did what you were told, because that's what the Army is all about. But when I left the Army, it was a little different. I had choices. Uh, I had choices that I had to take careful look at with my family, with my children. Um, and uh, with America's Promise Alliance. Um, and it served me well, and it served those people well. But I've got no illusions about 
uh, who I am and where I came from. The people who really taught me everything I need to know was Chinese military experts from 2,000 years ago and German experts. They're the ones who teach you about politics and making sure if you're going to war, you do it well and you prevail. Final question. So uh, you're a four-star general and secretary of state. Uh, you have grandchildren. Do they call you general? They call you secretary of state? What do they call you? Poppy. And you tell them, by the way, I was a four-star general, or you don't tell them Oh, that? no. Wouldn't work. They don't care. We, we, it's, a, it's a family. And, uh, you know, when I was a junior officer, it didn't make any difference. Um, but the more senior I became, okay, right, where, where's, what's his name? Uh, and that's the way I wanted it. I didn't want to be anything special to my children. The, the one quick story is when I was promoted to Brigadier General and I was stationed at, a, at Fort Carson, Colorado, and we just changed into these new camouflage uniforms, got rid of the old ones, it was cool. Uh, and uh, nice ca camouflage uniform. And I put it on one, one day when I got it, and I went home wearing the camouflage uniform. Um, this is maybe 20, 25 years ago. And so I walk in the house at Fort, at Fort Carson, and um, my youngest child, Anne Marie, who you also know, I think, she was about 10 or 12 at the time. And she was watching TV, and she turned around, looked up, saw me, and said, Mommy, the G.I. Joe's home. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> so, Colin, I want to thank you for your service to our country for many years. Thank you for doing this interview. And I'm sure if George Washington was here in person today, he'd say thank you for your service to the country as well. And would I ever say thank you to him for what he did for the country, not just as a president, but as a human being? who taught us what being a human being is all about. He didn't look for wars, but if one came, he would fight it and try to win. And then when he left, he left us with some messages that I will never forget. His farewell speech, his comments about, you know, don't look for wars. Um, uh, and he left us with that vision. And when he could have been the king of America, or the ex special president of America. He just wanted to be the president. And he wanted it known that's all he is, the president. And then he decided to leave. He could have stayed a little longer, but he stayed long enough. And then he warned us about spending too much money on military, and you know he warned us about getting too cocky. Uh, and uh, he left us with a great set of rules, which are still valid to this day. And I know them well. I have read them over the years. I have used them repeatedly as I have walked through a problem. And what do I do now? He helped.